Howdy Vine Trippers. I wanted to take just a moment to talk to you about the Texas Wine Lover website and their phone app for both uh, iPhones as well as Google devices. You can actually download this app, put it on your phone, or just go to the website if you're not an app person. And uh, if you ever want to go visit some of these great locations that we've been talking about in the podcast, this will give you a great information about the place before you go and you'll be able to find other wineries in the area. So if you want to make a day of it, go see several other places as well. You can search by region, you can sort the listings, find ones that are kid-friendly, family-friendly, even ones that host RVs, all kinds of different sortable listings you can find there in that app and on the website. You can find other things as well in the area like restaurants, accommodations, maybe events that are going on at the different wineries. So it's your one-stop resource that goes hand in hand with this podcast uh, to be able to find those great places to go visit. So check out the Texas Wine Lover website. It's txwinelover.com or go to their app. You can find it on the Google Play Store or the Apple Store as well. Enjoy your trips among the vines and use that app. Welcome to Texas Under Vine an exploratory podcast to scout out the best Texas wine country has to offer. I'm your wine guide, Scott, and I'm here to lead you on an auditory expedition to the vineyards and wineries across the great Lone Star State. Each episode will cover a different vineyard, winery, or wine-related business operating in Texas. You'll hear interviews, descriptions, and details about each location that will excite you to visit and experience them for yourself. Ready to plan a wine tour? Use these episodes to choose the most interesting spots for you and your friends to check out. Most of all, enjoy hearing about the rapidly growing wine industry in the state and what makes our wines and wineries the best. Howdy, fellow Vine Tripper. Welcome to episode 46 of the Texas Under Vine podcast. So I'm going to invite you today to travel with me to the beautiful Texas Hill Country. And we're going to settle down in a gorgeous meadow with the butterflies and the gentle breeze through the trees. And we're going to enjoy a little bit of wine together. Picture the green grass all around us. Listen to the sound of nature in our ears and feel that nice breeze blowing across your skin as you taste and sip this amazing wine. And guess what? We must be at High Meadow Winery in High, Texas. This winery was actually started in 2012 by a fellow named Mike Baytech and his wife, Denise, when they were actually out looking for properties Uh, where they wanted to build this uh, winery. They looked at a lot of different places through high, but they were transfixed by the side of this beautiful meadow. It had butterflies flying all around. It was just this idyllic location and they, they fell in love with it. And so they decided this is where they want to put down their roots, pun intended. Now, as they began the winery, they started off small, as many do, and kind of inconspicuous. They decided to start hosting tastings in the winery building itself, and they developed this relaxed ethos over that time that has since evolved into their winery mantra for High Meadow Winery, which is, get this, serious wine, fun people. And at High Meadow Winery, they are serious about their wines. When I showed up at the winery for a scheduled interview with Mike Baytech, the owner, and he's also the winemaker, I actually had to pry him out of the vineyard. He was out in the vines on their estate vineyard tending to the vines, and I was able to get him out to bring him in to do the interview for the episode today. They have an estate vineyard of about five acres, which he's currently expanding just a little bit, which contains Tempranillo, Montepulciano, 
Alianico, Rufasco, and Negro Amaro. And he's planning to expand it just a little bit, hoping to add some Terral to go. So one of the things you may have noticed in that listing of grape varietals, there's a very Italian theme going on here and a little bit of Mediterranean varietals he likes to play with as well. But Mike is a huge lover of Italy. He's traveled there so many times and uh, he really loves those Italian varietals and how well they do in our Texas climate. The winery itself is located in High, Texas, which if you're not familiar with the big metropolis of High, Texas, it's actually on the wine road 290 in the hill country between Fredericksburg and Johnson City, probably a little closer leaning towards the Johnson City side, but it's easily found once you get out there on 290. And when you go out there and you decide to do a tasting, they actually offer two different flights uh, for their tastings. You could do an all red tasting or Mike actually recommends that you try the blended tasting, which actually gives you two whites, a rosé, and two reds. That way you get kind of a little overview of, of all the different types of offerings that they have there at High Meadow. And this winery is very kid and pet friendly. And they even host some really cool, fun events for the kids as well as for the pets. Uh, they have one that's a dog show we talked about in the interview where they have all these contests and ugliest dog and funniest dog and all these fun things that they do for their pets and for the kids. But if you do decide to come and bring your little ones, make sure you bring some extra special libations for your children as they're only pouring wine in the tasting room. So you don't want them to get thirsty. Bring something along for the kids as well. When I went to visit for the interview, I was, again, able to sit down with Mike Baytech to hear a little bit about his background, his love for Italy and the places that they've traveled, as well as the winery itself, kind of how it got started and what you can expect when you come and you do your tasting and you check out High Meadow Winery for yourself. So without further ado, let's get to that interview and hear from him. All right. So I'm here with Mike Baytech, uh, the winemaker here at uh, High Meadow Winery. So tell me a little bit about yourself. What got you into the wine industry? So I grew up uh, down in South Texas, outside uh, Corpus Christi. And for whatever reason, I had an infatuation with trying wine. Okay. And uh, found a restaurant that actually sold me wine while I was in high school, underage. <laughs> but, you know, we won't name them. Oh, there are no. <laughs> oh, okay. Well, that may be why. <laughs> and, uh, but, uh, it was Italian place. And so San Gervese, Montalciano, all the Italians they sold there. I would stay after on like a Friday night, help them close. And then we'd, anything that was open was fair game. Oh, cool. Yeah. I got to close out those bottles. So, yeah. So, uh, kind of cut my teeth there, went to a and &M. There was a guy doing wine courses there, did okay. that for a couple of years and then left it, left wine behind, you know, still enjoyed it, still sure. was enamored with it, but I never knew you could actually do anything with wine. It makes your career out of it. Right. Yeah. Not, uh, not part of my upbringing. <laughs> so, and then, uh, later in life, my wife were just at kind of a pivot point and it was like why not okay so, why not i see what you did there yeah <laughs> <laughs> all right and then is that what got you started so tell me about the history of high meadow so uh i went to school at tech uh for the viticulture okay. program and during that time i was also doing slave labor at a couple of places <laughs> working uh some vineyard blocks helping with bottling you know anything mm -hmm. to learn and uh my wife had one incredible year really of sales and uh we had seed money oh, okay so at three years of looking uh chris brundrett was bugging me like every two three months come out to high come out to high you know <laughs> i got a realtor he'll show you you know several properties yeah so i came out uh visited the ranch next to us, okay. uh, which is huge. It was way too big. Came here, loved it. Hmm. A uh, couple of other properties. And then uh, that was a Monday. Tuesday, I brought my wife out 
and we drove in and the gate was right across from the Daiki garage and you go through this meadow and there's butterflies, there's lambs, uh, the dragonflies are skimming. Yeah. And it was just idyllic. You park under an oak and, and she's like, yeah, this is it. Is okay. it? I was like, yeah, this is it. And then put an offer on Wednesday. Wow. So, it's like this perfect idyllic hill country meadow scene. Yeah. It was absolutely beautiful. All right. And you can envision putting up your rows and, and getting the tasting room set up there. Yeah. I mean, you know, you, you kind of get enamored and it was like, oh, we've got to plan this out now. <laughs> now the rubber hits the road. Well, and then, uh, so as soon as we put that on, then we start doing some clearing and whatnot. All the cedar trees, I'm sure. There wasn't that many cedar. All the cedars are in the back. Okay. But planning the actual winery. So, uh, gosh, I spent a lot of time with Rick neighbors, uh, over at, who had Flat Creek back in the day. Uh, anybody who and just about everybody to talk to them. What do you, what do you like? What you built about what you built? What do you don't like? What would you do differently? And there was one in common thread amongst everybody. Yeah. I wish I would have built a bigger building starting out. Oh, okay. Because everybody had two buildings. Okay. At least. Yeah. Uh, because they started small and then yeah. it grew out, grew yeah. that. So well, we better build another building. And then you have another building and then another building. And I was like, okay, well, we're just going to bite the bullet and make a big building starting out. Go from the start. Yeah. All right. And when was that? Uh, that was 2012. Okay. So about 12 years now that you've been. And when did you open the door? Uh, 13. So uh, the first building we did was the winery. And we did tastings inside the wine. Okay, yeah. Just on production floor. Okay. We had picnic tables. We had, uh, oh, our dump buckets were the little kits that you give kids to go to the beach. Oh, yeah, the little pails. Yeah. Sand pails, were, everything. Those were our dump buckets. It's like having a Kentucky Fried Chicken box there or something like that. <laughs> Whatever you got. Well, I mean, it was just, it's cheap, it's convenient, and you can't break exactly. it. Because we're on concrete. Floor. Okay, there you go. So it's like, oh yeah, this is great. <laughs> so very informal starting out. Yeah. And uh, I think that kind of also set the tone going forward. Okay. So our motto uh, that we eventually came to was serious wine, fun people. Oh, okay, there you go. I like that. Yeah, because people come in and, you know, they're so tense at times. And it's like, there's no reason to be tense. Yeah. Uh, you go anywhere else, like you go to Italy and it's like, oh, I'll do the house wine. And they bring it to you in a jug. It's just easy. Yeah. There's no pretense or right. anything. And then uh, you go to a restaurant here and you got all these choices. And then somebody's looking down at you. Uh huh. Yeah. Well, and like I told you earlier, from based on my past experience, you know, that was my first thought was, I don't know much about wine. I always perceived wine as being this big thing and, and this big quantity of note, and you have to have this master sommelier to tell you what, you know, but it is easy. It, it should be relaxed and, and for the people, you know, and a very simple thing. So I like that concept that you have there. Um, and then you've got some vineyard here on site. So tell me a little bit about what you've got here on site. Yes, where I was working. Yeah, I just started. called, pulled you out of the vineyard <laughs> to come do this interview. So uh, we've got Tempranillo, okay, uh, Montolciano, mm -hmm. Negro Amaro, Rafasco, Alianico, and uh, in a little over a week we'll be planning uh, a block of Toraldigo. Okay. I love that you've got some of that, that, the, that still that Italian kind of influence from your early days with Italian wine. Yeah, we do. Basically, we're an Italian. Place. You like those okay. Italian varieties yeah. a lot. We do a little bit of uh, Mediterranean. So Tempranillo, just because sure. everybody <laughs> enjoys Tempranillo and it grows very well. Uh -huh. Yeah, it does great. Uh, and then we do a little bit of more Vedra and Carignan. Okay. So uh, we do an off dry red with uh, Carignan, more Vedra blends. Okay. And then how long, uh, how many acres do you have here? Uh, we have five and we're getting ready to put in another. Okay. And then how long have you had that vineyard on site? Uh, 2015. Okay. So pretty quickly after you open. Yeah. All right. Yeah. 
So before that, you were, I'm sure, sourcing, I'm sure you sourced some fruit still from High Plains and other growers, maybe in the Hill Country. So back then, there was only the High Plains. Yeah. There was no Hill Country growers, <laughs> per se. Uh, Grape Creek had some on site. Uh, uh, what? Uh, Dot Ron Yates, uh, Spice Yates, but Spice Wood. Okay, gotcha. Because I used to watch over a block of uh, fruit over there. And then uh, just not a lot of fruit was sure. there. And then I started at the absolute worst time <laughs> because there was the super drought yes. going on. And then right after that, there were two freezes. Uh, and the last freeze being in April. Mm -hmm. So there was like no fruit. So our Texas harvest was, I think, 40 cases of Treviano. Okay. Uh, that we had gotten. And uh, we're not even sure if it was Treviano because they just basically went through all their white blocks. Yeah. And they had enough grapes to just eke, eke out. Like Fill in some bins. bins. Yeah. So it's a more of a field blend pro probably of some kind. <laughs> Pretty much, but it was Treviano. <laughs> there you go. And then, so uh, we got some stuff out of Washington State. Uh, okay. God, we we had some fruit from War Seven Hills, some Sandra Basie that was absolutely gorgeous. Yeah. Yeah. And then after that, we were all Texas from 2014 on. Okay. And then, yeah, you manage that vineyard and everything here. That's a prospect in and of itself. Oh, yeah. My wife, uh, she, she loves and hates that vineyard. And, uh, uh, do you, um, and then of course I would think it may be only five to six acres. Um, is that, does that go in just to your estate wines or do you? Yes. Okay. Just the estate. Okay. Perfect. Cause we do an estate month, Volchana, estate Alianico, Tempranillo, uh, Rafosco we're releasing for the first time on its own. Uh, then, uh, we do a blend with, uh, it's called neighbors. So it's. Gerson Brothers uh -huh. uh, barrels in our grapes. Oh, cool. So neighbors working together. Yeah, I like that. And then, uh, so that's where the Negro Maro all Okay, goes. Yeah. yeah. And I was just talking to you about that before the interview. Negro Maro is one of my favorites. I don't know that I've ever had Rafasco. So it's not a well-known grape. Yeah. Uh, they were growing it down in Southern California, and it was doing really well. Yeah. And I was thinking it was... Uh, up near uh, Finito area. Okay. And I was like, and the rep was like, yeah, it's, it's likes the heat, you know, it's doing great in Southern California. And I mean, that's like a desert. There you go, it's Texas. Yeah. <laughs> and uh, I was like, oh, I want to do a red spark plate. Okay. Well, first time we harvested it, it was, I mean, so rich, yeah. so dark. I was like, you can't do a spark like this. <laughs> you gotta, you gotta make a still. Yeah. And then, uh, that block with it and Alianico, uh, we were fighting cotton root rot. Ah, fair. So the yields for a couple of years were like super low. Super low. And so we got the root rot kind of under mm -hmm. control. Yeah. Okay. Uh, well, tell me about the winery itself here. So, and you may have kind of already hinted at this through your story. It may be kind of a silly question, but I always like to ask people, how did you get, how did you decide on the name High Meadow Winery? Now you already talked about the meadow, so I'm guessing that's part of it, but. Yeah. And then we're in high and it's kind of like, you know, everybody used to always ask, you know, where the hell is high? High, right. Yeah. <laughs> and it was like, oh, we got to have it in the new. <laughs> okay. Uh, the other name, uh, there was uh, just one other. We had gone on a vacation with our kids when they were, oh, uh, I guess our son was in fourth grade and our oldest was going into high school. Mm -hmm. And we spent, uh, we went through Italy, but we stayed one, uh, two days in Bolsena. Okay. So it's about an hour and a half, two hours, kind of north of uh, Rome. Yeah. And it's a sunken volcanic lake. Interesting. And we, in Treviano, they grow so much Treviano there, but we hung out on the side of the lake. They had a concession stand and, uh, this, I mean, it's small town, but everybody was there. Okay. So there were teenagers and then we were, we'd hang out there and we're having, you know, pour beer, have uh Treviano in the afternoon. Yeah. 
having paninis. So now it was just, I, we just yeah. had a really, really good time there. Oh, cool. It was just so friendly. Yeah. But, uh, but then it was like, I met I just kind of won out. Okay. Gotcha. So kind of gave that debate, but then, yeah, I like that named after the area because yeah, a lot of people, when I tell them, I'm talking to them about the wine road here. They've, they've heard of Fredericksburg for sure. Might've heard of Johnson city. But when I talk about hi, they're like, what? Hi, where is that? <laughs> the halfway between. Oh yeah. And then there's so many wineries here. Uh-huh. Yeah. I mean, uh, just, I mean, immediate, I mean, French connection up the road, mm -hmm. narrow path. Yeah. I mean, William Chris across the street and you've got all the guys right over there. I yeah. mean, it's like great. More than just down the way there. Yeah. So cool. Well, um, let's talk some about your production facilities. You said, yeah, you do your production here. Um, and so you crush everything here. You bl you do every all the production here on site? Yeah, yeah. Okay. There's uh, two of us, uh, myself and Samuel. And then my wife helps out during uh, production too. Yeah. So she is, you always heard the term seller rap. Uh -huh, yeah. So uh, her term is physician is seller mouse. Okay. So a cellar rat does all the dirty work. Right. The cellar mouse keeps her hands clean. Okay, gotcha. <laughs> so she helps out uh, for all the processing and everything. Uh -huh. But when the cleaning comes around, she's gone. Yeah. It's just back in the mouse hole. <laughs> yeah. Yes. But uh, I will say we've done two harvests where it was just my wife and I. Okay. Uh, we, had, we had hired a guy out of Washington State, and he left like a week before harvest started. Oh, wow. Homesick, uh, homesick snowflake. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. No he, heat. <laughs> Can't he handle the heat, huh? Uh, he, he couldn't handle a lot. I gotcha. Yeah. He couldn't, uh, the stress of driving. Yeah. Was big for him. Yeah. But, uh, but yeah, so we have done, okay. uh, well, I think that was 18 harvest she and I did. Yeah. Wow. Wow. And then during COVID, we did uh, harvest it. Yeah. Our subs as well. We just couldn't get people out. And, oh, it's just, you know, weird time. Yeah, weird it was time. a weird yeah. situation. But the the funniest thing during COVID, we kept every everybody uh, working mm -hmm. when we were shut down. And it's like, okay, we are going to pay you like you're getting tips. You're, was, you're whole. Yeah. Pay your bills. Don't. Yeah. Put off stuff just because somebody says, Oh, don't worry. You can, you know, it's like pay your bills, be good citizens. Uh -huh. <laughs> and then we uh, delivered a uh, wine club. Yeah. That, that April. Okay. Ourselves across yeah. the state. Just took them hand delivered. You were the do DoorDash from Wine Club, huh? We did, uh, uh, we put 20,000 miles on our wow. club yeah. in one month. How just circulating throughout the state. Of oh, yeah. So, I mean, Justin kind of did San Antonio because he's uh -huh. over there. Uh, and then Kirk, who used to live in Houston, did part of Houston. We did the far side out to Galveston. We were living over in Austin at the time. So we all kind of split Austin up. Mm -hmm. And then we did everything uh, above Austin. Oh, that's crazy. Crazy. I would never want to do that again. It was fantastic Yeah, while we did it because uh, people would just light up. Yeah. I mean, you're the first people we've seen. And you're bringing month. wine. Yeah. It's like we haven't left the house in weeks. Wow. And then, you know, they just, so things that, you know, we're like, oh, we're going to just take this stuff off. No. There. Every time you stop, you're just talking. And it was like. One of those things, the, probably the only thing I like about COVID. Yeah, <laughs> that's that's a really cool story, that, that, that trip you had. And I'm sure that meant a ton to these people who live miles and miles away. And here's the winemaker showing up on their door with the, with the wine. I mean, one of my favorites, uh, so going down the, to Corpus, uh, there was a little bitty town where I was going to make a drop off. And I mean, when I see little bitty, it was one street <laughs> and there, for whatever reason, there was a guy sitting on the side with a fork left yeah. and I'm going up and down looking for an address yeah. and I cannot find it. It was like, 
I'm looking on Google Maps, Apple Maps, and it was like, am I dumb? This yeah, what one, the world? one road town. <laughs> and then I finally found it was an oil field count compound and it was all. Oh, like set back in. Yeah, set back in. So I go in and knock on the door and this guy came out. He's got shorts on, <laughs> but from here up, He's dressed up for a Zoom meeting. Oh, I love it. <laughs> Coat tie and everything, yeah. shorts on. Yeah. And then uh, and then he looks at me and I was like, hey, it's Mike. You know, I'm here from High Meadow. I've got your wine. He goes, damn, this is good. He goes, I'm drinking during my Zoom meeting now. <laughs> <laughs> I got my water bottle. I'm going to put it in there. Oh, no. You, coffee cup. He, he got the, he was he put the whole bottle, bottle out. Yeah. I love it. Yeah. So, uh, but the look of surprise on his face. Yeah. yeah. That's cool. Did you, were you close? I mean, I don't want to dwell too much on COVID. It was an interesting time, but did, did you have to stay your doors closed super long? Cause I've talked to a lot of wineries who have said that during COVID they kind of benefit a little bit in that. And I noticed you've got some tables and things kind of secluded. So with that social distancing thing, wineries were a place where people could go to kind of get something and be away from people and yeah. still circulate. So at the start, the governor. Yeah, shut everything, everything down. down. Yeah, they shut us down for several months. Okay. And then after a while, people were like, this is ridiculous. We're, we're going to open. Yeah. So we had a table over here uh, outside and it had cups and it had corkscrews. Yeah. And a couple of dump buckets. And it was like, we cannot open your wine. <laughs> But you can't. here is everything you need if you would like to wander the property. That's awesome. <laughs> Social distance among the butterflies. Oh, yeah. Well, I mean, we can have 150 people here. Sure. And they're so spread out, 100 people don't even know there's another. <laughs> you know, other people there. Yeah. That's awesome. I love that. Um, okay. Well, let's talk about your wines for a minute. So just particularly as a winemaker, what are some of your favorite wines to make? So the favorites, uh, probably my best memory was, uh, I was over at Dukeman. Okay. A uh, year, couple of years before we started and they were, uh, fermenting Alianica. Yeah. And you just got this crushed roses in the air mm -hmm. and it was like, oh my gosh, yeah. I've got to make that. <laughs> Doesn't matter how it tastes, that phenolics is yeah, amazing, right? Yeah, and uh, and so Dave was an early hero uh, uh -huh. for the stuff he was making, and then uh, and then Dolcetto, just because okay. that was just one of those where it just smells so good, mm. so aroma based, uh, and then uh, gosh, now we do so when we were. God, 25th anniversary. We were in Southern Italy and it ties in, <laughs> but, uh, our, my favorite wine on that trip was an Alianico Rosé. Okay. So we do Alianico Rosé. Oh, nice. It's a little bit more structure than a regular Rosé, uh, but, uh, it's a tannin. So, and it just tastes so dang good. Ours, we call not quite pink. Because I've said the darker color. The first couple of times it was dark. <laughs> it was like super dark. Now we've got it to where we, it looks like a very delicate rosé, but it still has the tannins. Yeah, yeah. You got to figure out that exact amount of skin contact time to get it to the right color you're looking for, and not a, a minute over. Oh yeah. So uh, I love Alianico. I love me too. The structure. I love the smells. The memories that I have of it. Uh, San Giovese is another one that, uh, you know, I cut my teeth on back in the day. So fond memories there, uh, for whites, I mean, I love Viognier when it's sitting at about 20 bricks, mm. 2019 bricks. Okay. It's busy. It's, uh, it can smell like pineapple in apricot and it's just we're so rich and it tastes so good and mm -hmm. so that's one where i just i always get excited when it starts fermenting because after a few days it's like it, it's like your breakfast drink okay yeah it's like hardly any alcohol but it's got the juice it's busy yeah it's just delightful awesome 
what about from a customer's perspective? What are some of the most popular wines here at High Meadow? Ones that you just can't keep in stock and they just keep people keep clamoring. Probably the number one would be the Full Monty. Okay. Uh, Monte Polciano. Uh, okay. Yeah. That, uh, the Boom was uh, also Italian red blend. And then on the white side, like it's usually our, uh, our white blend. Okay. And uh, either Junkyard White or Colo Bianco. But uh, it's, we're going for a scent mm -hmm. on that. And we never could figure out uh, at the early days. And somebody looked up and was like, what? Because it was almost like juicy fruit, the yellow. Oh, okay. Yeah. In uh -huh. the day. And we looked up uh, all the ingredients in there. And there's a uh, fruit. And it's uh, not well known, and it grows off a vine. Okay, uh, Paul Paul. I haven't heard of that. Yeah, so we we started uh, back in the day. It's like, oh yeah, it's Paul Paul. <laughs> it's the Paul Paul uh, plant. Okay. So, uh, but that's just uh, easy drinking. It's our it's our patio. Your wine. patio wine. Yeah, really great during the summer. I'm sure. Oh yeah, big yeah. time. Yeah, yeah, that and Trebbiana. Okay. Yeah. Well, um, you, we talked a little bit about the location here and your facility. So I see you, you started big, like you said, uh, with intending for having groups. Do you do a lot of events and things like that out here on the property? Oh, uh, Mac, early we uh, we used to do weddings. Oh, okay. For uh, a couple of years, and then I think we cut that out. Uh, Too many bridezillas. Uh, no, no, it's just a uh, dilution. Uh, uh, okay of where you, what you want to do. Mm. So that, I mean, we didn't want to be in the wedding business. Yeah. And it was one of my best buddies, his wife, who uh -huh. was doing the coordinating. Okay. And it was her business. Sure. So uh, we basically just got a portion of whatever yeah. she brought in. Okay. Because it was her baby. Yeah. And uh, she was having her third child and we're like, Dawn, do you want to keep doing this? Yeah. You've got three kids. We have three kids. We know what that <laughs> means, time commitment wise. And she's like, I didn't know how to bring it up. I've just been, but yeah, she goes, I can't do this, you know, with three kids. And we're like, we not. Yeah. And then when she was saying it was done, it was done. Go ahead. We'll yeah. Weed that out. Okay. Yeah. So, uh, well, when you have somebody you, you trust yeah. and you don't have to worry about anything or, sure. And then her assistant was a young man named Jordan. Well, Jordan uh, grew up with my kids. No, oh, okay. Uh, and uh, he was an orphan. A lady in their church had adopted him. Nice. And But he used to hang around our house. He went to vacations with uh, us. He's like so, the fourth kid. Yeah. And so it was one of those things. I don't, we don't have to worry about anything. Yeah. So, and... And then weddings are stressful. I bet, yeah. Very, very stressful. I'll be officiating one next Saturday, the fact. All right. Well, I saw that out front there was a sign about a dog event. Oh, like. yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, so some of those types of things you'll still have here. Yeah. Tell me about so, that. So those are, I mean, so our dog passed away about two years ago. I'm sorry. But we've always been dog friendly. I mean, we've got, you know, Plenty of, Lots of land. Plenty of throwing area. <laughs> uh, and uh, it's about a year last year, Nikki was like, hey, we got to do a dog thing. Everybody brings their dogs over here. So it was like, okay, we're going to have the prettiest dog, the ugliest <laughs> dog, you know. And we had like 30 or 40 dogs show up. Really? So we're like, this is nuts. Yeah. And they brought their owners. You're going to drink some wine. Yeah. That's so, nice. Uh, and it was fun. Because people are parading their dog, you know, yeah. and it's funny when somebody's parading their dog and it's the ugly dog. <laughs> so, but yeah, it's just a fun thing to do. Cool. Yeah. We're going to do in the fall. We talk, we've been talking about it for a couple of years, but basically, uh, medieval, uh, medieval times and high, and we're inviting other wineries over. Okay. So we're going to have jousting. Hopefully uh, between the wineries. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So we'll have the King's Court up here, the jousting out there. That's with, cool. With little, you know, 
Punk Keep you in Little Renaissance Fair here yeah. at High Meadow. Yeah, and it, we just thought it would be fun to have, you know, neighbor neighbor wineries and stuff here, and then, you know, everybody has their banner. <laughs> so, uh, it's cool. So, we're it's, signed up to come to that one. So, uh, we're planning that out right now, so. Well, let's say that um, a listener is starting to get excited to come check you guys out. Let's talk a little bit about what they can expect when they come in. So, um, what does a tasting typically look like? Do you have a set flight of wines that they taste, or do they pick their wines, or what does that Two look like? Two different sets. Okay. Some people who want just red, we have uh -huh. all red flight, but typically we like people who do the blunted. Okay. So it's going to be two whites, mm -hmm. rosé, and two reds. Okay. That way you get the, a little spattering of everything. Yeah. And then if they want another red or something, Kirsten, who you met here uh -huh. earlier, well, it's like, oh, if you really like that, well, let me let me let you try this. Okay. So, and that way they kind of get a broad idea. Okay. And then how much does a tasting typically cost? Uh, 25. Okay. Um, and when they come to do a tasting, the next question is usually, if, what are your operating hours? So during the week, we're closed on Tuesday. Okay. And other than that, Wednesday, Thursday, we're in uh, Monday, 11 to 5. Okay. Friday, Saturday, 11 to 6, okay. and then Sunday, 12 to 5. Okay. And that's, of course, on your website, I'm sure, so people can yeah. verify all that as needed. Um, and then are there food options when people come, or can they bring their own food, or how does what does that look like? But, okay. So you can bring your own stuff if you like, and we also have a small kitchen, so everything's scratch-made. Uh, we do a couple of dips. Uh, the spinach artichoke is really, really good. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, then we have, uh, oh, it's uh, so like a green, uh, they call it cool dip. Okay. It's light green, avocado based. Mm. And it's just, it's just good. We, uh, we do that during the summer. Yeah. We just brought that out. We took away our uh, risotto. Oh, okay. Yeah. yeah, that's more of a warm, I mean, a cold weather yeah, kind of thing, I would think. But, and so I really miss not having <laughs> You're ready for fall to come back around. Oh my gosh, yeah. And then and then we do a couple of different sandwiches. Okay, cool. Oh. And cheese boards. <laughs> yeah, of course. The, the obligatory charcuterie board. Yes. Um, you've talked about pets and pets pet friendly, but what about kids or people under 21, things like that? Yeah, yeah. Uh, I mean, we had three kids growing up, so um, they went places with us. Yeah. Now, you know, there's... You can get in trouble while we're here. Uh, and so we always say, you know, supervised. Sure. Supervision. Uh, there, There's no such thing as a bad kid. It's bad parents. Yeah. <laughs> and is there offerings for the kids for drinks and things like that? Because I mean, you're not going to be pouring some wine probably for your kids, but, or should they bring their own? Bring their own. Okay. Uh, we used to do soft drinks and stuff. And yeah, yeah like we're, that's not, not, not our thing. Perfect. But, uh, but one time a year we do where it's also for kids. So, so we do a kite festival. Oh, nice. And, uh, we also have another event and it'll actually, we'll do a Gatorade testing. <laughs> That's awesome. So, you know, different Gatorade. Yeah. Yeah. So they get to feel like they're getting yeah. the whole experience. Yeah. That's cool. I'm getting flavors of <laughs> orange in this orange Gatorade. <laughs> I love it. Um, so what are your kind of busy and slower times? What is the best time for somebody to come visit? Would you say? Uh, I mean, it's really weird after COVID before yeah. COVID it was like, oh my gosh, Saturdays are, uh, nuts. Yeah. Now Saturdays are just a little busy, but not bad. Okay. Uh, Fridays, I always like Friday afternoons. Yeah. It's the end of the week. If you come out, it's just like. It just sets the tone. Yeah. Wind down the week a little yeah. bit. As you and then say. Sunday's always chill. Uh, we've got, uh, well, they're friends now. They've been coming out so long. One one guy works over at William Chris, but, and they'll come over and have cigars on a Sunday afternoon. And that's <laughs> once a month. Yeah. That's yeah. nice. And what about wine club? Do you have a wine club? Well, I know you have a wine club because you told the story delivering it to everybody. So tell me the details on your wine club. So... We're a little different on the wine club. Okay. Uh, we limit how many people are in our wine club. Okay. Because we're small. Yeah. 
and we don't want to be big. Sure. So, uh, my wife and I do the vineyard. We, we make the wine, we mow, we take care of everything. Yeah. And then, uh, so our wine club is small. Okay. And then what are the details of the wine club? What are there? Three, six, 12, that three, kind of six thing. Months, yeah. And how many times usually do you ship per uh, year? So four times a year. Okay. And then, uh, for case clubbers, uh, choice of three out of four. Okay. And do they get a mix of wines and winemaker's choice? How does that work? So for, uh, three and six, I choose. Okay. So it's a red, a mix or white, uh, -huh. uh, for both the red and, or the three and the six in case club, they can do whatever they want. <laughs> they get to set it up. If you're going to buy a case, you get to pick. Yes. Gotcha. And then, uh, but a lot of people will go, oh, let Mike pick it. Yeah. So they trust you as the winemaker to. Well, and now what's in its season right now? Yeah. Like for the one we just had, uh, we had a white, mm -hmm. a rose, and a light red. Okay. And the red is a uh, Dolcetto and it's a uh, Novello style. So okay. it's from, it was from the 23 Harvest, neutral barrel, modeled with the white. Okay. So super young. Yeah. And it's spring one. Okay. So, uh, and then during, and then that is, that's probably my favorite pickup party because it's casino party. Oh, nice. So we have the gambling tables out yeah. all, and, uh, that's kind of like where the wine we talk about a little bit, but everybody's just having a good time. Yeah. I like having a really fun time. Cool. If people want to try your wines, but for whatever reason they can't get here. Uh, do you do any kind of distribution or do you sell on your website or how can people taste it where they can't get here? Yeah, we do the website, uh, but we have one line in HEB. Okay. Junk Junkyard Red. Okay. So uh, it's uh, just a simple red blend. It typically was our best seller yeah. here in the tasting room. And uh, we call it the marketing wine. Uh, basically, we're putting it out there for wine club. Uh -huh. If you can't come... It's your midweek. You go to the grocery store, AGB. It's on the shelf, 1997. Oh, perfect. So you can have it yeah. ever you like, uh, no matter, you know what. And we're in all the AGBs that are, you know, wine centric. Uh huh. Nice AGB. Yeah. Wine. And so people could get a taste of that and say, well, wow, this is really good. I got to get out to High Meadow now and try some of these other amazing wounds. Yeah. I was at Texas Wine Auction um, in May. I was pouring, so I was I was volunteering, you know, I was helping to pour wines, and I, I'm pretty sure you, Junkyard Red, we were pouring that. Yeah. And I had so many people come up, and that was one of their favorite wines. They kept asking me to pour that and get it. So I was like, because oh, I, I haven't tasted it yet. I've seen it, but I haven't tasted it yet. And I was like, wow, well, everybody's going for this one. That's great. So just thought I'd pass that on to you, a little tidbit there. So you got this great operation going on. Do you have any plans for future growth? You talked about the vineyard, adding on to the vineyard a little bit. We're adding on to the vineyard a little bit, but we want to stay small. Okay. Yeah. And then do you, about how many production or cases do you usually produce each year? Uh, between three and 4,000. Okay. And so you're going to try to stay about that level, maybe add, are you adding new varietals to the, to the vineyard? Or are you trying to just expand what you already have? Expand what we have. Okay. And then uh, also uh, we're getting less... Uh, high plains fruit and really trying just to focus here. Okay. Build more on your esteem yeah. stuff. Yeah. Okay. Excellent. So um, there's a lot of places that people can go here in, in Texas and in central Texas to go to wineries and so forth. So what really sets High Meadow apart in your opinion that makes people say, I've got to go check that place out? I guess the biggest thing for me is going to be the people here. Okay. So uh, when somebody comes to work here, it's not a grueling process, you know, interviewing and stuff. It's more, do we like you? Okay. Do you fit in with us? Yeah. Do you have the right attitude to, to make people feel like they're at home? Mm -hmm. Because here we're small. We want to be small. We do not want to be big. And one of the things is we want people to be relaxed when they're here. Mm -hmm. So. Uh, now for myself, for the wine, I like to focus on single varietal. So mm -hmm. Alianico, Montepulciano, San Gervaisi, all single varietal. 
yeah. uh, Barbera, Nebbiolo, all so that you can taste what it is. Mm -hmm. I mean, I love red blends and I like white blends and all, you know, all that. But at the end of the day, I want to taste Tempranillo. Yeah. I want to know what Alianico is yeah. because a red blend is, you don't know what you're tasting. It's, you know, yeah. it's cab based, Merlot, what, you know, Petit for dough. Notes of this, notes of that. Yeah. But it's, it's all over the place. Yeah. But, you know, if you go to Italy, you're not going to have those blends. Yeah. For the most part, it's going to be, oh, this is my Alianico. Okay. So they're more focused on that single varietal. Yeah. Okay. And, uh, and I've found, you know, just going places. There's, uh, down in Southern California, a little Italian, uh, winery down there. And we're sitting, one of the brothers is singing to the crowd. Oh, I love it. Uh, his, uh, the, the eldest is at the table with us and he's got his arm around me. We're drinking <laughs> both our Alianicos. And he asked me, he's like, how you make this taste so good? <laughs> he goes, this is better than mine. <laughs> now that's a statement right there. And, uh, so we start talking as far as on Paisan, you know, on the growing side and, uh, and, uh, you know, different techniques and everything, but he did, uh, he went to Italy mm -hmm. and he looked for the best Alianico producer there. Okay. And came back and he does a two day on the skin fermentation. Wow. Presses off and then allows it to ferment. So okay. it's softer than Yeah. That. But I was like, well, that's kind of cool. Yeah. So I did a Sangiovese like that. Okay. And it was absolutely gorgeous. Yeah. Uh, now we ended up blending cause I did a little trial. So it wouldn't, I mean, it was like a ton of fruit, but it was, uh, uh, two DS, two day Sangio. Oh, okay. And it was from that two day. Fruit. Yeah. But it was fruity. It was a little softer. Uh, mm. but I was like, I really like that. Yeah. So it's amazing. I think from a winemaker's perspective, the things that you can do to play quote unquote oh, yeah. with the wines to do different things and get different results and see where they go. It's almost like being a mad scientist, you know, I want to try this and see what this does and see what we get from it. Sometimes it's a like resounding success. Sometimes it's a, yeah, that didn't work. <laughs> Yeah. It's kind of like, uh, the first time I did the, uh, uh, Italian black, but yeah. we were doing last. So where you've got all these samples and we're doing, you know, testing for, you know, BA and all these things. And at the end of the day, we just dumped everything together and it was like, that tastes like crap. <laughs> so, but that night, uh, I woke up at like three and I put this blend together mm -hmm. and the next day I get, uh, you know, I go up to Joe and I was like, Hey, can you make, uh, 200 mils of this? And he looks at it and he's like, this can taste like crap. <laughs> I was like, can you please make give it a try. 200 <laughs> mils? Trust me. Yeah. And then he's like, wow, this is actually good. <laughs> so that, our boom blot. Yeah. And, uh, gosh, that one, like, uh, double goal, San Francisco mm -hmm. international. Well, that's speaking a lot right there. So, uh, so, and then that was also, uh, the top Texas wine, your Houston rodeo for 2022. Congratulations. That's so, fun. But yeah, so the boom kind of is, you know, that's one of the fun ones. Nice. I like that. Being on the board of the Hill Country Winery Association. Yeah. I always like to, to throw something in about that. Yeah. Because, uh, 25th anniversary, uh, for the Hill Country Winery Association and which is a big deal for us here in Texas, but, uh, it's one of the things that I think, you know, drives me to make really good wine, okay. to be a part of this young industry. And it's funny, you know, 25 is young. Uh, but, uh, and then everybody who works together here, mm -hmm. because we all are, I mean, it's very, very easy. I can call somebody up if I have an issue and it's like, oh, well, this is, we had that problem and this is what we did. If somebody needs to borrow something, it's like, 
mm. you you're on it. Yeah. Uh, to help people out. So if you come to a winery over here, that is, uh, you know, Hill Country, we really, really, really want to wow people's socks off. Mm -hmm. uh, just as a whole, mm -hmm. uh, you know, we play up our neighbors and uh, enjoy their wines and we just want other people to try it and, yeah. Yeah, and give it a shot. And we're all different. Yeah. I mean, that's a crazy thing. I mean, I've got a French producer. I've got William Chris, the uh, Morvedra Kings, you know. Uh, it's just so all these different wineries, and they're all very, very different. Yeah. Except for one thing. We all love Texas wine. Mm -hmm. Serious wine, fun people. And he's serious about that. That is their mantra, and you will see it in effect when you go to visit there for sure. So you've got to go check it out for yourself. And maybe even look for that really cool Medieval Times event that Mike was talking about. I know that's one that I would love to go check out when they do announce that. They're going to have jousting and all these other fun games like he talked about, drinking some great wine. That will be one to remember. So keep your eye out on their social media and on their website for the announcement of that one if you're wanting to visit for that event. And as always, make sure to check out their website before you go. It's www dot high meadow.com now that's high h y e meadow.com when you go there you'll be able to see things about their history more about the winery itself what to expect when you go in for a tasting yourself you can even get information about their wine club there that mike talked about in the interview remember it's limited access and i love the name of it they called their wine club friends in high places get it high places and you can even see their events calendar there. You can make a reservation if you want to do so for your tasting when you go. You can even shop online and get some merch for High Meadow there on their website. So definitely a one-stop shop. Make sure and check out www.highmeadow.com. And don't forget, when you go see them, make sure to tell them you heard about them on this podcast, Texas Under Vine. Now, after we finished the interview, I was invited to go to their members tasting lounge to be able to sample some of these serious wines that Mike was referring to. And I got to say, Mike knows what he's doing back there in the wine cellar. He does an incredible job of pulling out incredible flavor and great taste from all of these different varieties that they have. They're in their state vineyard and some that they're sourcing from the High Plains. And he really does a great job of highlighting each of those different single varietal wines like he talked about in the interview. But when it came down to it, I think my favorite one in the tasting was a blend. It was the one that he mentioned that won the top Texas wine at the Houston Rodeo in 2022. Yep, the Boom Wine. It is a bold blend of four different varietals. You have a little bit of Negro Amaro in there, some Montepulciano, you get some Sangiovese, and even some Alianico in that blend. So like he said, he woke up in the middle of the night and wrote down that blend and people thought he was crazy and now it's such a great wine. It was so good, so much flavor, so smooth. Definitely make sure you try the Boom wine when you go for your tasting. I couldn't leave this location without buying a bottle of that for my wine library. So, Boom 2018 became my wine library bottle for this episode for High Meadow Winery. All right, we have sat back. We've enjoyed this beautiful meadow with the butterflies. We've enjoyed sipping on some great wine. But the time has come for me to move on because I got to go check out even more great wine destinations here in Texas to bring you the information on those. But before I go, I'm going to ask if you could do me a quick favor. One of the things that will really help this podcast is to get some more ratings and reviews on the podcast because it really helps it get seen with the algorithm and all that to different people. So if you wouldn't mind, it's free to you. Go out to wherever you're getting this podcast, and whether that's Spotify or Apple Podcasts or any of the other podcatchers out there. And would you leave me a rating and review there? That just really helps me get, kind of get up in the ratings. People see it's a real thing and, and can we can get more wine enthusiasts enthused about Texas wine. People who travel to our state who want to check out the great Texas wineries that we have here and gets them excited about the culture that we have. And if you're watching this on YouTube, thank you. That's my primary location now. We've got the video here. And so make sure that you like, subscribe, and follow. 
and leave a comment. So if you're watching on YouTube, um, tell me what you like most about High Meadow Winery or what you're most excited to, to see or to experience when you go for yourself. Just put that in the comments right down below. And with that, my time is up. So don't forget, subscribe to my socials and follow the podcast to be notified anytime a new episode is released. And until then, happy trails and bottoms up, y'all. Thanks for listening to Texas Under Vine. We strive to provide you with the best information about wine businesses all over Texas. Be sure to check out our website at texasundervine.com and follow us on our socials at Texas Under Vine to stay up on all the upcoming episodes. Please email us with any suggestions or feedback. Also, contact us if you're interested in donating, sponsoring, or advertising on the podcast just to help us cover our expenses and bring even more great info to you in future episodes. Above all, travel safely, and most especially, drink responsibly. Howdy, Vine Trippers. Did you know that I now have a merchandise store for Texas Under Vine? I only have a handful of limited items, but you can go check those out and wear your Texas Under Vine swag if you'd like to tell all your friends about the great wine locations we have here in Texas and maybe get them interested in the podcast as well. So there are things like t-shirts, There are there's a hoodie, there's a beanie, a ball cap, things like that. But one of the most exciting things I have right now is my limited time offer t-shirt. That's my season one t-shirt. So this is your Tasting Through Texas, Texas Undervine season one t-shirt. It's only gonna be available for a little short amount of time. On the back, it has all the different locations like a band tour t-shirt. Uh, so this is a limited time item and you can go out and get it now. And one of the great things about that t-shirt is a portion of every sale goes to support the Texas Hill Country Winery Scholarship Fund. So you know that by buying that t-shirt, shirt, you're also investing in the, the growing and flourishing of an amazing wine industry here in Texas and all of those people that are going to come and make it even better. Check out that merchandise store. It's on my website at texasundervine.com. Just go up to the top. You'll see the link for the merchandise store.